everybody. Welcome to the Abstract Podcast. This is going to be really exciting today. Uh, my name is Greg Refner, CEO and founder of Abstract. And we have Ali Punjani, uh, TEDx Ponzi Highland organizer and business development at Give Campus. Ali, please say hi and good morning to everybody. Hey, y'all. Good morning. Thanks so much uh, for having me, Greg. Yeah, it's our pleasure. So um, I, I understand, rumor has it, this is your first podcast that you've done, right? <laughs> that is correct. Yeah, this is a cool new experience to see how this is actually done and the magic happens. Okay, well, yeah, I feel like maybe uh, you've set the expectations a little too high. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll try to uh, we'll try to knock it out of the park for your first one. But um, I'm really excited to dive into. Um, your background a little bit. I think uh, kind of the theme for us today is really going to be kind of letting your passion and 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 where you kind of, you know, let let drive, you know, kind of where you go in your career. And yeah. I think some of the things that you've experienced and done in your past will, will hopefully help our, our listeners understand that uh, it's okay to kind of maybe bounce around a little bit and kind of find where your passion lies before ultimately kind of maybe landing in some type of technology role. So sure. really excited to dive into some of those things. So um, kind of segue, when I look at your backgrounds, um, finance, organizer for political campaign, TED Talk organizer, um, when your high school guidance counselor asked you what you wanted to be when you grew up, what, what did you what did you answer? How did you answer that question? <laughs> so I was like really confused. I think when I was when I was when I was growing up, um, my family is is from India, and I grew up in this in this kind of eclectic community where um, both my parents are immigrants. Neither of them went to went to college, and I grew up in pretty in a pretty low income neighborhood. Um, so our high school had. I think a, one of the lower graduation rates in the state. And so for me, it was like, I could go to college. I had other options. I think the military was definitely an option. A lot of my friends enlisted right after high school graduation. Um, and I ended up through this, this college tour program at my mosque, getting introduced to uh, kids who look like me who were at school, who so came from similar family backgrounds as I did. Uh, I was meeting students at Hopkins, at Georgetown, at, at Vanderbilt and Duke, and, and really just incredible, incredible schools. And they were doing really cool things there. And I think for me, that was um, a huge motivator to, to maybe not figure out what I wanted to do exactly, but figure out where I wanted to be in the next stage. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's kind of, I, I would say that was kind of my 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 impetus of like just being inspired by by the people around me, their stories, and has kind of led to my involvement in doing political outreach for the recent Senate election here in Georgia, um, providing a platform to folks in in the Atlanta community who who have great ideas, who have done incredible work for for their communities, but who necessarily don't have the mic or their megaphone um, to share those experiences with others. Um, and so I think those kind of those, those childhood experiences that really influence what I do now. Nice. Okay. So um, I told you that there was a, a likelihood we were going to go off topic a little bit and um, we're going to get to that a little bit faster than normal. Yes. Um, but uh, I think some of the things that, that I struggled with um, and cause I grew up in a, a little bit of a, I don't know the exact details of your raising, but uh, you know, I grew up in a less than uh, less than middle class family, and so um, when I when I started going out to the world at kind of that age of getting into college, um, I faced what I think some might kind of consider like uh, imposter syndrome a little mm. bit, kind of like maybe I didn't belong. Um, did you ever feel that way when you were kind of going and, and talking to people at you know Georgetown and? all those fun colleges that kind of people kind of dream about every day. Yeah. Every day. Um, I think, so I went to Emory for my undergrad um, and uh, Emory's like one of, one of those like similar peer schools for a lot of the, the ones that we mentioned earlier and the culture shock of, of coming from like backgrounds like ours to, to a school like Emory or Duke or, or where have you. Um, was really intense. I'd say my, 
I, I was meeting folks whose parents were C-level execs at Fortune 500s, um, who were Olympic swimmers and divers, um, who, who were doing really like, just like incredible, like truly incredible things um, that I had only like seen on TV and didn't really think that was like a possibility. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and I would say I had it like during my time at Emory, every single day, I would have to like reassure myself that yes, I got into this school just like everyone else. I belong here. I am doing very well in my academics. I have friends here um, and, and I should feel empowered to, to take space and, and, and help other people who might feel similar to me also have yeah. space for themselves. So yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I would imagine that, um, you know, as you start to go out into the world, you, you kind of have this like diversity of backgrounds and experiences. And I would imagine that there's a lot of people that feel that way. We just probably do a good job of hiding it and maybe suppressing that kind of that fake it until you, you make it type of cliche saying, right. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that because uh, I think, um, it's important to talk about things like that. Cause I would imagine that anybody who's maybe struggled through, um, life to get to where they are, have faced that at one point or another. Uh-huh. So, um, throughout that, that progression of your experiences, um, we're going to get into a little bit of that a little bit later, but when did you decide that uh, kind of technology was was the way you wanted to go? That's a really good question. So I, I'm trying to think. Um, so my career path is a little wonky. Um, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college. Um, and I kind of followed other people who were kind of around me for, for a couple of reasons. One, because they seemed really confident in what they wanted to do. So I was like, you have so much confidence, you have to be right about this. And two, the careers and professions that they were choosing, mostly in finance and consulting, uh, were very lucrative. And it was a great way for me to have financial stability for myself and then support my family. And so I, I interned um, at an investment bank for, for a summer, I then worked in private equity for another summer as an intern. Post-grad, I worked in management consulting. And I think these were good experiences. I learned a ton from them, but they weren't experiences necessarily where I would wake up and re- be really excited about my job. It wouldn't really like help me jump out of bed per se. Um, and so I remember one one day, or I guess like a, over the course of a couple months, um, I had joined a pro bono project at my consulting firm and it was working with a national education nonprofit. And I absolutely loved it. I I know like the the typical, the typical thing in consulting is be the first one there, the last one to leave. Um, And I was doing that with, with the nonprofit client that we were, we were just doing out of like our our annual goodness of our heart kind of situation Um, where most folks were like, okay, I'm on a pro bono client clocking in at 9 30 clocking out at 4 30 i'm gonna get out of here uh, but i was just I, I was so enamored with the work that i thought it was so cool and so impactful that i was meeting folks who were who were in their communities who were doing such uh, such important work and were impacting the lives of, of folks who really needed it um as i wrap up that project and i'm, I'm kind of sitting there bouncing between a couple of projects for an industrials company, an, uh, an insurance company. And I was on this dating app. Um, and it's a dating app for South Asian folks called Dill Mill. Um, and I yeah. matched with someone who, and the way Dill Mill works, like for other dating apps, it's usually folks within your locale. So yeah. you'll match with someone who's like 10 or 15 miles away from you. With Dill Mill, there's like, there's, there's no cutoff. The, okay. the cutoff with Dilma is like, I can match with someone in Nebraska and I'm based in Atlanta. Um, and so I had matched with someone in New York who worked at Code Academy at the time. Okay. They had mentioned, hey, if you're really interested in, in going into education, why don't you explore the intersection between education and technology? Love it. Um, and I said, okay, well, that sounds really cool, but like, what does that even mean? And uh, <laughs> she explained to me that like, oh, ed tech is a thing. And it took me a while to realize like, oh, this is a huge, huge industry. 
Yeah. Um, and I realized like, oh, Khan Academy is an ed tech company, Coursera, the list goes on. These, how, these names that I kind of was familiar with, I just didn't know how to classify them. Okay. Um, so ended up being, she sent me a job description, applied for the job, got the job and moved to Boston to work for my first ed tech company. Um, and I've really been passionate about technology as, it's, as it can be used to uh, amplify social impact. I love it. Is it uh, so crazy how some of those things kind of happen, right? Where, you know, you, you're going down this road trying to maybe find someone you want to spend the rest of your life with and it results in, you know, kind of what you end up doing for the rest of your life or a good portion of your life. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's awesome. And um, it's just, a, what do you call that? Like divine intervention, fate? Like how does, what do you even need to describe that moment where you kind of like epiphany light bulb goes off? Honestly. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, whatever it's called, it's, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty solid thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree with that. Absolutely. Well, it almost seems like kind of a, a natural fit for you with some of your experiences as part of a, a mentor program, um, as part of the, the Gates Foundation that you were a part of, the scholarship program, okay. your experience at Emory, um, EdTech. Do you ever feel like your previous experiences um, and that passion you followed kind of um, made it super like easy to to not, to not, to once you got into ed tech, you're like, oh, this is a thing. Did it become so much easier to, to kind of just immerse yourself in that world and kind of learn about it? Do you feel like it ran, you, you, you ramped faster? Kind yeah. of how did that help that transition? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think, I think my background of, of like trying to figure out like my own journey. <clears throat> within education from coming from the environment and the schools that I went to, to having the experience that I had in college um, made me really empathetic for, for what ed tech companies are trying to do and the mission that they're trying to solve. Um, and so I think I bring that with my work. I, I think if, you, if, you're, if you're working in sales, you have to really believe in the product. Otherwise it is a drag to try to sell something that you don't, you don't believe in to someone. Cause if you can't convince them that this is a solution that's going to solve their problems and, and alleviate their pains, then, then who is. Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Drag. That's the right word, right? Like, because you literally are dragging yourself through broken glass every day when you don't believe in the product, right? Yeah. Uh, it's like sales, you fail more often than you're successful. And so that is, you know, when you add in the fact that you don't enjoy what you sell, all of a sudden it's like, okay, now I'm uphill failing, wind both ways, snow both ways while walking on broken glass. Like it sucks. Yeah. So, um, so it's a good segue. So as you've gone out into this world of uh, business development at Give Campus, do you feel like your, your experience, your personal stories um, have enabled you to be more relatable? And you, you mentioned about empathy, like how has that impacted your success and your ability to, to kind of maybe move the needle from a, a business development sales perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. So in, in a couple of different ways, um, when I was at my first ed tech company it was called Mentor Collective based in Boston. And their entire um, mission was essentially scale mentorship programs using software. Um, and I found for me, mentorship was such a critical, critically important thing. Um, Cause I think I slowly realized that like the first generation college student, the low income college student, um, what they're, what they're missing isn't a, a, a sense of drive or sense of capability, but it's a sense of social capital that a lot of the other students already have when they come into university, whether it be that their parents went there, so their legacies, they have older siblings who have went through the process already that can advise them. Um, but it is really the social capital at the end of the day. So having already been in those shoes, the conversations came pretty naturally at that point yeah. because I was when I'm speaking to deans or I'm speaking to provosts at schools, um, it was basically saying, hey, look, I, I am probably your target demographic as a student. Um, 
maybe I don't live in that state, maybe I don't share the same ethnic or racial background, but when it comes to being a low income first generation college student who doesn't know what's going on is a fish out of water in university, I, I resonate and I share a lot of the experiences that your students are coming from. Um, and I truly did believe that the product we were selling and mentorship as a whole is a great way to accelerate having social capital. Um, and I've brought that to, to the work I do at Give Campus as well uh, with the idea that if schools can fundraise more effectively and they can encourage folks to give back to their universities, then they in turn can use those funds to provide further scholarships and grants, support services to the students who need it the most. Um, so it's huge, it's huge. Do you, um, when, you, when you go and you talk to like a dean of a college, um, do you often find yourself you know, opening up and sharing you know, maybe intimate details about kind of what that process was like for you going and getting into college and building that social capital? Yeah, I think it depends on the conversation. Um, sometimes I, I'd say it does come up where, because the root of it, you're trying to improve the student experience. So by asking questions about like, okay, well, what are your students really asking for right now? Are they asking for, um, more hours of operation for dining halls and libraries and that sort of thing. And that's kind of what you're, what you're thinking about. Are they asking for more social connections on campus, more guidance when it comes to career exploration and, and academic programs? Like what is the actual route? And then once you get there, I found myself in, in, in some instances being like, oh yeah, I remember when, insert story about when I was in college here, um, but that's really, really relevant. And, and I think- yeah. What that does, it does, it does two things. One, it, it builds this bridge between myself and that dean um, with a sense of, oh, I understand. Of, I understand the, the, the obstacles that your students are facing, that your staff are facing. I worked in residence life for two years. So from, from a housing and programming perspective, I, also, I can also bring that into the conversation. Um, and two, it is that, the, stu- the, the, the obstacles that your students are facing aren't uncommon. This is happening at universities all across the nation, whether it's like a top tier university um, or a local community college. These issues are prevalent in the masses. So, they're, so, so clearly the work that we're doing isn't just applicable to X, Y, or Z school, but it can be used as one part of a toolkit to help these students feel more empowered uh, to do the work they want to do and achieve the goals they've set for themselves. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And again, it goes back to believing what you're really representing and selling. And, um, you know, if you do that, the conversation kind of flows naturally and you don't have to make up those stories anymore. You don't have to kind of memorize that talk track because you know, that talk track, like the back of your hand, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. so from a hiring perspective, um, you know, I get resumes all the time from people wanting to get into technology, but they don't necessarily have like the background. Uh, Maybe they were insurance sales or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they worked as a general manager at a sporting goods store. Um, You have a little bit of a different background where, you know, some of your, your background is directly relatable to kind of the the ed tech space you went into. But, um, you know, for anybody who maybe is looking at this and going, Hey, I want to get into tech, but, you know, I don't necessarily have the quote unquote background on my resume. What would your, 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 um, your advice be to them to maybe let some of their like life experiences and relevant stories maybe shine through a little bit more? Yeah, that's a really good question. I I think about it this way. Um, Let's, let's take the example of a car salesman. Um, someone who, who has done the, the grind work of being there day in and day out outside trying to sell cars. Um, that is such a great experience and toolkit of skills that that individual brings to any job. Like, yes, they may not have done like software sales or tech sales, what have you, but they probably got more years of experience to be able to contribute in a really significant way. And the other thing I'd recommend for folks who are coming from a non a non-technical background is 
find the parallels. So you mentioned the insurance sales. There are tons of insurance tech companies out there that are growing. Lemonade is one that I think of off the top of my head. Um, and I think through finding A, what you're doing and how, what the parallel is in tech, um, that, you'll able to, that you'll be able to hit the ground running because you're creating less friction for yourself as you make that transition into tech. And the second thing is you'll probably be better at it because you already have a good understanding of how this works and what the language looks like, how people talk to each other, the pain points that, that prospects and customers are experiencing right now, you're able to address because you have that background. So whether you're a car salesman and you want to work in, in, in tech, you could go to a company like Carvana comes to mind, or if you're doing insurance, you go to Lemonade, or if you are, goodness, I mean, doing a number of, of anything. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. There are so many opportunities for you to transition into that parallel industry that's in tech. Um, I would just recommend that anyone who does it, does it for the right reasons, because they want to expand their background and their experience. And they also want to do something that they're really passionate about. That's such a good point. I've never even thought about that, right? Like if I'm selling cars, because I mean, I've, I've gotten car, car salesman resumes all the time. And, um, you know, if I want to get into tech, like go work for a Carvana, you know, get that one or two years experience. And then that opens up all the doors that you need to have opened up to go into ed tech, martech, fintech, wherever you want to be, because now you kind of have that inside sales technology motion uh, kind of on your resume now. So it's a, it's a stepping stone if you're willing to take it. Um, so that's, that's a great piece of advice. I love that. Um, so kind of wrapping some things up here, kind of I want to end with uh, maybe your biggest piece of advice for our listeners. Um, you know, you're, where you've gotten to today, Ali, is, um, is pretty unique in terms of your path into to, to tech sales with your kind of experiences, um, a variety of experiences, right? Um, what would be kind of your biggest piece of advice for anybody who's, who's kind of looking at yourself on LinkedIn and going, okay, this, I, I, I relate to Ali. Um, I'm, I, this makes sense for me. How do I take this next step? How do I find that, that moment of fate, right? Of, of, uh, kind of my guiding star where I want to be, what would be your biggest piece of advice on how, how I go about finding that? Mm. We are dropping a lot of knowledge on this Thursday morning. Wow. It's a lot. Um, it's a lot for a Thursday morning. <laughs> um, that is such a great question. I think you know I, th I think it comes down to a couple of things one sales is hard it is it, it's i mean i've i've worked on political campaigns i've organized huge multi-hundred person conferences and and this is right up there with it um it is really really tough the one thing i will say is that as you're exploring doing sales, you have to go in with the mentality that no job is too small. There is such a need for personalization in sales. And as, 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 as you and I work in startups, so, so we understand like the importance of scaling and demand for growth, particularly if you're doing like a venture backed startup that, Investors just have high expectations. Uh, I have found that the, the, the quote unquote wins, the relationships that end up becoming, coming into fruition in terms of partnerships come from really strong relationships that I developed earlier on through doing the little things, sending an article on a one-off email, um, calling ahead just to make sure we're scheduled for that meeting later this week. Um, maybe sending over, over some snail mail, whatever that might be, just to be oh, more right. personalized, right? Yeah. Um, I would say that's, that's part of it. The other part of it is like, once you get into a company, yes, sales is incredibly important and you want to make sure that you become 
that you really focus on your craft, but there's more to working at a company than just the work that you do. Uh, you also have to be willing to, to commit to improving the company culture, whether that be through you know, establishing parental leave for, for new parents, whether that be through creating a diversity, equity, inclusion initiative at your company or, or doing volunteer paid time off for, for folks so they can feel that, that their company supports them to have a meaningful impact in their community. Um, there's so much to belonging at a company than just hitting your numbers. Um, so yeah, I say all of that to say that no job is too small. You have to really go in with this willingness to, to, to do anything and almost everything when, when you join a new company. So as long as you have that mentality wherever you're going and you make that really clear in the conversations you're having as you network for that next, next, uh, next opportunity, then I think that'll serve you really well. Oh, this is a lot for a Thursday morning. Maybe we should have scheduled this on like a Monday afternoon. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I appreciate that. So I took a couple big things away from our conversation. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me is, and I've been thinking about how to, how to summarize this in a, in a short and succinct way as we've been talking, but um, don't let, uh, don't kind of hide your experiences, like let your experiences of your life, like kind of help maybe drive where you want to go in your life. Because ultimately I think people that are successful are willing to share and willing to expose a little bit of themselves Um, whether that be in a sales world or a marketing world. And when you are able to kind of be more relatable as a human, it it kind of opens up a lot of doors. And I think your career has been an example of that where you've kind of followed kind of your path and the struggles you've had. And ultimately it's led you to a place where you're able to be relatable on so many levels and that's led to your success. So I think that's a, a pretty big takeaway. Second one that I never even thought of was kind of the stepping stones of her career, right? If you're in car sales and you want to get into tech sales, go to Carvana, go to someplace like that. Um, I forget what the other car company is trying to compete with Carvana right now, but, um, you know, go into that world and kind of cut your teeth there and then open some doors. Um, And then the final thing that we just talked about, no job is too small, do the little things. Um, It's amazing how many people don't do the little things. And so you can separate yourself from everybody else by sending that handwritten note, by, by calling them as opposed to an email, by setting up a Google alert and paying attention to what the company or the, the campus is doing. Um, and then just dropping them a note, not even asking for anything. Hey, saw this super cool. Um, you know, congratulations. Bye. Uh, so I think that's awesome. So for anybody who wants to get in touch with you, learn more about you, maybe, uh, kind of learn more about what you're doing from a TED Talk perspective. What's the best way to get in touch with you, Ali? Yeah, you can add me on LinkedIn. Uh, The name is Ali, A-L-I. Last name is Panjani, P, like Paul, U, and as a Nancy, J-A-N-I. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your life story, kind of some of your thoughts and lessons learned along the way. It's been awesome to have you and uh, keep kicking ass. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much for having me. It was really a pleasure. Absolutely. Bye. Bye.